There we go. Sorry, Mayor. Go ahead, Mayor. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, my apologies. No, you're fine. I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice. For all. This is an open meeting of the Seward, Nebraska governing body. The city of Seward abides by the Nebraska Open Meetings Act in conducting business. A copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is displayed in the Civic Center meeting room as required. Tonight's <laughs> council meeting will be recorded through Zoom. Greg, are we recording? Okay, <laughs> I forgot to remind you. Um, which will be posted on the city of Seward's website at a later date. <clears throat> Any citizen wishing to address the council should message Greg Butcher, who appears on Zoom as City of Seward, and he will recognize you when it is your turn to speak. At that time, please state your name and address for the clerk's record, and you will have up to five minutes to speak. All remarks shall be directed to me, the mayor, who shall determine by whom any appropriate response shall be made. The City of Seward reserves the right to adjust the order of items listed on this agenda if necessary and may elect to take action on any of the items listed. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Here. Schmidt. Here. Beck. Here. Coulterman. Present. Singleton. Mm -hmm. Unmute him one more time. Here. Camprick. Here. I will check on Miller because if he arrived late, uh, he may be towards the back of the line. I do not see Miller present. And I'll note that uh, Council Member Hendricks is not fully participating at this point. Uh, she has her audio on and she's listening in, but uh, due to some other things that came up, she's not gonna be able to participate. She'll inform me when she's fully in the meeting. So she's not on the roll right now. So. All right, so first item is the draft of minutes, is the draft minutes of December 15, 2020. To approve. Second. Moved by Beck, second by Wilkin. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Keeps muting. Yes. Campra. Yes. Motion passes. All right, the next two items can make up the consent <laughs> agenda for this evening. Moved to approve. Second. Moved by Singleton, second by Coulterman. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Camper. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. The first item we have under administrative items is the, the recommend Jew, Gary Jewell as manager yes. of the VFW located at 243 South 9th Street for a Class C uh, liquor license. Bonnie or Greg? The VFW submitted an application for a new manager of their retail liquor license. Um, we didn't find anything that would um, be other than a recommendation to approve. Are there any other questions or comments from the council? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Did we lose Council Member Schmidt? I think we did. We'll come back. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. 
Campra. Yes. And unless I'm remiss, I think Council Member Schmidt dropped the meeting. So uh, I bet he'll be back. I'm guessing so, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. Next item. Request by Hughes Brothers to display 100 year anniversary banners along Seward Street and near the municipal band shell in 2021. Greg? Yeah, this is a request that Hughes Brothers has been working on for uh, most of the year, a little bit derailed by COVID in preparations for this, but back on track. Uh, Mindy and I have been working with them and, and they kind of laid out, uh, you have included in your packet, uh, a design that they would like to put up that notes Hughes Brothers 100 years, 1921 to 2021, made in America with a uh, photo of some of the um, apparatus they build uh, for electrical lines on there. These would be displayed from approximately 4th or 5th and Seward all the way down to the Hughes Brothers plant uh, located approximately at 14th and Seward. Um, we would make sure that since these aren't on our regular banner permit, that the ones adjacent to Highway 15 uh, met the restrictions of our current state banner permit. But other than that, we, we control the, the banner arms all along Seward Street. Um, this is part of also, I think, the celebration for our 4th of July this summer. So it really goes in hand in hand with that. And, and hopefully, um, knock on wood somewhere, we're going to have our parade, and so this will be a nice addition demonstrating uh, part of that mission and celebration of 100 years at Hughes Brothers during 4th of July. Anywhere that we don't currently have banner arms, um, Hughes Brothers will create the banner arms and help get those placed up. And so not a huge undertaking, but they wanted to request permission to do so. I can answer any questions you have. And I don't know if Patty's on or not. She might have joined us. She might not have. But uh, Patty, Jane Roth is who I've been working with predominantly on this one. Are there any questions or comments from the council? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Moved by Beck, second by Coulterman. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. You gotta unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm trying. We might have to come back to him to get audio. Uh, Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camperin. Yes. Motion passes. Next item is discussion and consideration of lighting and tree plantings along the Carroll K project. Greg. Yes, uh, clear back in I believe late October, we had a discussion as brought forth by council member Camperith. We had met clear back in February before COVID kind of hit, I had a discussion uh, about the opportunity to take a look at lighting and tree plantings and other plantings along the Carroll K project. Um, as that project took off this year, the project began, we didn't really get back to it because of COVID and everything kind of slowed down and stopped. The project kind of kicked off in August and then Councilman Member Camperth brought that back uh, to the attention of the council. Uh, it was the recommendation of council that the two members of the ward, which would be council members Coulterman and Beck, along with myself and city engineer Mike Onaby, meet with the homeowners and the homeowners association along Eastridge to discuss what items they may uh, or, or concerns they have about those kind of two main things, plantings and lighting. Uh, we did meet in, I believe, early November with them. It was a meeting held partially via Zoom and partially in person with proper social distancing and, and all that. Um, and we laid out the lighting plan for them, uh, showed them the locations, and then also discuss what plantings were included and not, and then what possibilities and room there was within the right of way, especially along the west side of the project to uh, place some plantings. And then what ideas and, and thoughts they had. And, and, and so we had that conversation with them. 
As it related to lighting, their biggest concern were the lights that are located on the east side of the project, which would predominantly face and light the roadway to the west. So that would face their homes. Um, Mike can speak to how many there are. I think there's approximately one main curve uh, that has maybe four to five lights that are on that east side. There might be some more. And then there's a few down closer to Bader that I don't think would be an issue. Um, but on one of the curves, <laughs> there is a uh, pretty good number of lights. And so we said in working with the council members that we would go back to JEO and ask, is there a way that we could move those to the other side and baffle them to direct all the light towards the east, towards the creek uh, and, and the uh, sidewalk connection to the trail? Uh, the other thing that came out of it was that we heard from Linda Gerke that they were working with the local NRD to look at what plantings would be available to plant along uh, kind of as a shelter belt. They had a pretty intricate plan that they were looking at uh, with multiple different plantings, trees, and also some bushes and shrubs. But when they looked at the, the dimensions and availability of the right-of-way as it's being constructed, um, it, those plantings weren't gonna fit. And the NRD made that recommendation. So one of the discussions we had that night of that meeting was would the homeowners association be interested in partnering with the city that if there were some plantings or the council would approve some plan, would they be interested or willing to put some of the plantings on their own private property, which is the farm ground located to the west of the project. And they said that they would take that back to their homeowners association uh, to have that discussion about whether they'd be willing to put some of it on their property. Um, I think that's a general, and I'll let Council Member Beck or Coulterman clarify if, if there's anything different that they remember, but I think that's essentially what we took away from that meeting in early November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mike Onaby and myself contacted JEO. Julia Ogden is our project engineer on it the next day and filled her in on what <laughs> we're looking at in regards to the lighting. And she got pencil to paper and filled that in for us. And I think we were looking at approximately um, four to six thousand dollars in changes. The first question we had though was, is there a specific transportation reason why those lights are on that side of the road versus any side of the road? Uh, and she stated that due to the fact that the roadway curves, all the lights are located on the curves for the most part until you get to the straightaway on Bader. And predominantly, you want to put lighting on the inside of a curve because if you're going to go off the roadway and centrifugal force going around a curve, it's going to take you out. And so by putting the lights on the interior of the curve, if you were having an issue on the curve and going too fast, you would go out and you wouldn't hit any lighting structures. It's not required, but that's the usual practical engineering reason for why you put them on the interior side of a curve. So that's why they're designed the way they are. Um, but she said that they can be moved. It's not a requirement or requirement even of this project that they be located where they are. It's just predominantly if you're cons making considerations for that sort of trajectory and when vehicles leave the road, you put it on the inside of the curb. Um, I think Mike, just you can probably shake your head. Was I right? Four to 6,000 is what we think the cost to move those lights. Predominantly that's engineering work to redraft drawings. It's a federally funded project. The drawings need to be accurate to what is built. So redraft drawings and then a few thousand dollars in equipment to bore under the roadway the right way, reconnect all the, the cords uh, and electrical wiring the way they want it uh, and move pedestals because they're not going to pour those pedestals on the other side. So that's the, from the lighting side. And so we finished that up relatively quickly. Um, we didn't hear anything back from the HOA. At one point late in November, uh, city engineer Mike Onaby received an email from Linda noting that she was confirming that she did have Mike's email and that she was working with the NRD and she'd get a hold of us. We didn't hear anything else through the month of December. And then in late December, um, I had made contact uh, with Gerald Homp, who I believe is the president of the Neighborhood Association, um, and asked, hey, what's, what's the status on this? What's going on? And, and they said that they had met already and approved using their private property potentially, um, that Linda should have got a hold of us, but we had never heard anything. And so um, I think Gerald poked Linda and Linda emailed us back and uh, basically confirmed that the NRD wouldn't plant in the right of way there uh, and that the HOA was agreeable to put it on their private property 
but at this point made it sound like they wanted to go it alone in regards to the plantings and bushes and things like that. And so that's kind of where we left it. Um, unfortunately, just the HOA wasn't very timely in getting us information back. So it took a long time. I think we could have wrapped it up very quickly, but um, communication was down. I know COVID and other things are going on the holidays and stuff, but it kind of dragged on. Um, we fulfilled our end of it. We let them know what we found. Um, and so that's kind of where we left it. And that's where we're at right now. And so uh, we can take any feedback or questioning from you. Mike knows a lot more of the technical. Um, we do have some plantings currently along it closer to the, uh, what we refer to as the butterfly garden, the, the park area that's closer to Bader. Uh, there'll be some tree plantings and things there, especially to uh, shield out the direct homes that are directly adjacent to the project. Uh, the, pro the property owners on Eastridge obviously have a whole farm down to their project. And so there'll be some dilution of the light from that distance. Um, but that's where we ended up. That's where we're at now. And so we can kind of answer questions and see what direction you want us to take this and, and go from there. Hey, Greg. Um, yes. So is it fair to say then that really the, the only the specific issue before the council right now is going to be the lighting on that curve just because they need a decision sooner than later and there is a bit of an expense although not a great expense in relative to the total cost of the project but that's really i guess the question that's before the council that you kind of need an answer on potentially right now we're in a, i don't want to delay it because again communication has been really hard on this for whatever reasons and so if that's the direction the council wants to go and says we're willing to try to address the lighting issue and that's kind of where we're at on this that's fine with us me and mike can move forward with that and uh go that route if you want to go deeper or you don't want to do anything but it would be nice to have some direction and a way to go now just because once the weather clears in late february march they're going to come back in on that project and finish it up for that trail connection and sidewalk grade and and put in the plantings for the garden uh, along with whatever else we ask of them um so, we kinda... so i guess the question then for the council does anyone feel strongly about um moving those lights that are in question or are you feel comfortable with the current design or do you yes, question it, in the spirit of working with the neighborhood association if that's something they requested i don't feel that the cost is heavily onerous I guess I would, I would like to see us work with them and move that forward if the rest of the council would agree. I would concur with Jessica. Me too. Any other questions? Well, I, I make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, moving of the lights. Okay. okay. Second. The motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on this item? I'm just gonna note, unless the council gives me any other direction, we're gonna deem that this is kind of the end of this project then for us. We'll make these amended changes if this is approved tonight, uh, work with JEO, and then we're gonna move, administration's gonna move on. We have other projects we need to get to that we're lining up for the summer. So just to lay it all out there for everyone. So we have a motion and a second, unless there's any other discussion, please call the roll. Wilkin? Yes. Schmidt? Yes. Beck? Yes. Coulterman? Yes. Singleton? Yes. Campreth? Yes. <laughs> Motion passes. All right, next item, item number four is a resolution adding a stop sign at 4th Street and Waverly Road. Greg? Yeah, this was a recommendation that came to us by Street Superintendent Bob Myers, noting with the current construction project and things going on on Waverly Road that the gates through the cemetery, uh, the North Cemetery have been open. And so vehicles that are going through there are not specifically signed to stop when they're coming out of the Northern Gate on the Waverly Road. Even though those gates are shut most of the time under regular conditions, uh, quite often, we wanted to make sure that that's just safe for the public. And so we requested that we do do a resolution uh, to place a stop sign there, just in case they are open for different events or during different periods of construction. I'll make a motion to, to move forward with that. 
I think we need to, do we need to introduce the resolution? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. It's a resolution. So Jessica, would you like to introduce the resolution? I'll introduce the resolution. Thank you. Okay. The resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2021-1. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? So move. Okay. Second. I have a motion by Camperth, second by Wilkin. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Council member Singleton. He's unmuted. We'll go Camperth. Yes. All right. And Bonnie has a cleanup one for me. So Council Member Schmidt, do you want to vote in favor of that prior liquor license agreement? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Council Member Singleton, are you there? Yes, I am. Do you want to vote in favor of the uh, resolution for the stop sign? Yeah. Thank you. Motion passes. All right, next item number five is an amendment to the downtown revitalization DTR program guidelines to allow for 50-50 matching funds on all approved projects within 17-DTR-107, update on all projects and preparation for project closeout. Greg. Yeah, we're kind of finishing up and winding down. If you noticed in downtown, you might've saw some window work going on right there on uh, Seward Street between 5th and the highway. Uh, kind of the closeout of most of our projects, we're pretty much done. We signed the extension through February because of contractor issues and COVID. Uh, but with talking with DED and Tom Bliss, our administrator at SEND, their recommendation was to go back and ensure that all the current projects got funded up to 50-50 at this point, um, which was our program guideline. And then if there was any additional money left over, our recommendation was that any projects that went over $100,000, which was the base level threshold to max out, that those projects could seek equal funding up to 50-50 on their projects. We would just take whatever remainder we had left. So if we have $5,000 left, and we had two projects that were over 100,000, we would match 50-50 up to 2,500 for each of those projects. And we would just split everything evenly that was left over. But the reason for this is to ensure that the city is able to take all those state dollars and utilize them in downtown mm -hmm. rather than giving them back or reporting them back over to the state. We really want to ensure uh, that all these projects and all the dollars that we had available to us come into downtown. The reason we're not opening it up again is as you guys well know, the application process is tedious. The SAM registration process and everything else that's involved in that is really hard to do. And so the recommendation was just close these up get them finished up, all the checks and submissions out by the end of February. And then that gives me and Jonathan Jank the opportunity to begin the process to apply for another round of, of grant funds or a new project. Maybe we don't do a, a straight uh, commercial rehab. Maybe we look at a specific sidewalk project or one of, the many, one of the many other projects we identified in the downtown revitalization plan. But we wanna close that up to prep me and Jonathan also to, to get started on the next round. Um, I know that Jonathan's chomping at the bit to, to get that submission in, so we're excited to do so. But um, this will give everybody, everyone will get 50-50, up to $50,000, and then any of those that spend over 100000 on their project. And we already have receipts and everything for these people, so it should be a quick turnaround for me and Nick and Tom Bliss. But I can answer any questions you had. This did go before the DTR committee slash LB840 committee and was approved unanimously at their December meeting. Any questions or comments? Move to approve the amendment. Second. Moved by Schmidt, second by Camperith. I will note for the record that Council Member Miller has joined us. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Please Mayor? call the rule. Okay. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camperth. Yes. Miller. Yes. Motion passes. 
All right, next two items we have are updated job descriptions. Item number six is the updated job description for wastewater treatment sanitary system operator. Greg? Yeah, the, the big one for us is every time we have an opening uh, in a position where we usually only have a single person possibly, we like to update that job description, take a look at it before we post it back out in the paper uh, on websites and things like that. And so that's the opportunity we have with both of these two coming up. I'll explain the next one. But for the wastewater treatment and sanitary system operator, uh, this is a very technical one that requires some licensing and things like that. So we wanted to just make sure we had everything perfect with Tim Richtig, our water superintendent. And he's reviewed it along with Bonnie and myself. And so we'd recommend this one. Um, and then we can get into the next, excuse me. If you have any questions about any of the changes we made, usually it's just putting it back more into a form that's consistent with the changes we're making in all of our updated job descriptions, so. Move to approve the description. Second. Okay. Move by Camper, second by Coulterman. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camperth. Yes. Miller. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, item number seven is the updated job description for utility billing account clerk position. Greg. This one's technically not open yet, but uh, we did receive uh, news from Rhonda Bumba, who has served in this position for decades now for us in City Hall, that she's retiring this year, approximately in April. So we... Uh, are sad for ourselves, but excited for Rhonda and, and where she's going on this position uh, and where her story takes her next, but that's what's going on. And so in preparation for that, we wanted to get this one out there as soon as possible, make sure that us in City Hall felt like where this position was gonna go matched the job description, put it out and then hopefully get somebody in for maybe some overlap with Rhonda because Having somebody in that position for that long, it's very specific and technical, uh, overseeing all of the billing that goes out on the utility side, signing up customers, uh, and doing a lot of our technical work with water and wastewater and electric uh, is really, really important. Plus, we're also transitioning our entire billing and meter system right now uh, to an updated AMI system that will be two separate systems running those two different utilities, water and electric. And so... We wanted to have some overlap time to work with Rhonda and train up. Um, we asked the question, of, and we are cross-training at people in the office, but we don't believe anyone in the office currently is going to apply for this position. And so we know it's going to be ultimately filled by somebody that comes from outside of City Hall. Um, and so that's, that's the reason we're getting started on it early. This is a very uh, technical position that we want to make sure there's a smooth transition. Um, we're excited for Rhonda. Sad for ourselves, but we want to get ahead of this one. And so uh, that's what we present before you here tonight. Any questions for Greg? Move to approve the job description. Second. Moved by Schmidt, second by Campreth. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. <coughs> yes. Camperth. Yes. Miller. Yes. Motion passes. Next item number eight is an ordinance amending the comprehensive pay plan, changing the titles of utility billing account clerk and wastewater treatment sanitary system operator. <coughs> Greg? Uh, just a technical cleanup bill to make sure the titles match what we have in our ordinance for pay. Obviously, we'll list the pay and the salary positions. Actually, they're both hourly, but we'll list those pay positions. So we want to make sure all our ducks in a row. We're not changing any of the current uh, wages on it for those descriptions, but we are making sure the names and titles match up correctly. So that's that's what this is. Any questions for Greg? I'll introduce the ordinance. All right. Introduced by Schmidt. Give me one second here. I 
to find the ordinance so I can read the ordinance. So give me one second. Here. Have a yellow sticky 2020-1 or 2021-1. Oh, Bonnie, good to have you back. All right. An ordinance to provide for annual classification of officers and employees of the city of Seward, Nebraska, to provide for a title change for utility billing account clerk and wastewater treatment sanitary system operator, to provide for longevity pay and payment of part-time employees, to provide for a date such classification and pay ranges of compensation shall become effective, to provide for publication in pamphlet form, to provide for a time when this ordinance shall take effect. The ordinance has been read by title and is designated as ordinance number 2021-1 and the title is hereby approved. I need a motion to dispense with the statutory rule. So moved. Second. Moved by Colterman, second by Wilkin. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the rule. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camperin. Yes. Miller. Yes. Motion passes. This is ordinance number 2021-1. Would anyone like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted as read? So move. Move. Uh, I'm gonna go with Camperin. Second. And Schmidt on the second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question is, shall ordinance number 2021-1 be finally passed and adopted? Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Campreth. Yes. Miller. Yes. Motion passes. All right, next item number nine this is an ordinance amending Article 2, Section 52.1.11, entitled Reduction of the Spread, Reduction in the Spread of the Novel Coronavirus COVID-19, Chapter 51 of the Seward Municipal Code, establishing a sunset provision to March 3rd, 2021. All right, Mayor, before we get started, would you want me to do some uh, flight control here? Um, you want me to, I could go over some of the procedural aspects of this. Everyone's kind of on the same page. Okay. And then you can play, you can play clean up on anything I miss. Um, so first, I guess I just want to explain procedurally where we're at regarding the proposed extension of the current mask mandate. The Seward Memorial Health Systems recommended that the current mask mandate be extended through February, which is why the proposed ordinance before the council tonight has a new sunset date of March 3rd, which would be the day after the council's first meeting in March. So if tonight's mask mandate extension were to pass, then the council would have another opportunity to extend it before it would sunset again. Uh, once discussion has concluded, uh, any council member may introduce the ordinance uh, if the ordinance is introduced then the first vote would be on whether to waive the statutory requirement for three readings uh, this vote requires six yes votes to pass if it passes then a motion from a council member to pass the ordinance itself may be made after that motion then there will be an opportunity for council members to discuss the proposed ordinance before voting on it which would require five votes to pass if the vote to waive the statutory requirement of three readings doesn't get six votes, then the motion fails. We end discussion this evening and would have the second reading at the next meeting. Um, as I mentioned when we first started, and for some of you, I think have joined us um, since we, we opened the meeting tonight, I would just want to, I guess, um, talk, I'll just kind of repeat what I said earlier so everyone's on the same page. Um, that, uh, let me find my notes here. I guess, uh, oh, that's what I was going to say was, if you do wish to speak uh, this evening, Greg is on the Zoom as the city of Seward. 
So you just need to message him directly that you wish to speak. And when it's appropriate, he'll call on you and uh, you will have up to five minutes uh, to, to speak uh, this evening. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be asked to state your name and your address so that we have uh, a full record of who participated this evening. Um, Greg, is there anything else you want to cover? Uh, for any technical issues, when we are done, I've received no further requests to speak. I will unmute everybody and just check if there's somebody on the phone or something like that that also wants to speak. We'll try to catch them right at the end. Then I'm going to remute everyone and we're going to move on through the procedural part. Um, and so that's probably the, the only other one. So if, if you do want to speak, message me, City of Seward, and then we will, uh, I'll put you in the queue. I have two currently in the queue. Um, and I will note, I did receive a message from Council Member Hendricks that she is available. And so uh, she is now part of the meeting. So we can go from there if somebody wants to start. Or do you Greg, want to start? I could just add one more thing, Greg. Yep. Um, and you, you'll have one opportunity to speak. We, we don't go back and forth um, unless there is a question by myself or a council member that we make basically call on you like a classroom. Um, but otherwise, you'd have one opportunity to speak. Uh, I guess last time we had um, the moral health care system sort of get us started uh, on the discussion. So if either Roger Reamer or um, Dr. Kettner or someone else would like to uh, get us started. I'd appreciate that at this time. All right, I will turn it over to Roger. Roger, I think you're actually unmuted. Yep, I think I did it myself. Thanks, Greg, appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Roger Reamer, I live at 1616 Carroll K Boulevard here in Seward. I've been with Memorial Healthcare Systems. I'm in my 21st year here as their CEO. And um, prior to tonight, I was asked to put together some statistics and information regarding COVID-19 in our area. Um, the approach I chose to take was the same approach I've taken with the, all the staff here at Memorial Healthcare Systems and the board since April. Each week, I do a report on these various statistics and try to share information with our team weekly around these type of stats, because we think these are the stats and these are the measurements that have become standard for us to take a look at and get a feel for what's going on in our community. It drives our protocols, it drives our procedures. It helps us identify what we need to get put in place as things change. And so I hope this is beneficial. I know it was quite long. Uh, I have information and data back to April. Um, so we, we've, we've been following this for a really long time. I'm not going to go through the whole document. I know you've got it. Um, hopefully we had a chance to read it. I hope it was, has been beneficial for you um, in helping you with any decisions you want to make yet this evening. But I do want to just cover the summary points um, real quick because I've got some updates to this. Um, I guess the short of it is, uh, before I get into that, is you know we feel still feel that the transmission of coronavirus in our county, in our community, is still too high. The disease of COVID-19 is still being treated in our community. Um, you know, when we're seeing nine cases a day, that's still too high of a number. Um, I'll start off with my, sum my summary notes of statewide hospitalizations, because that was a big key topic back in uh, the last time we got together, and it should be. Um, I give you information for the last two months on hospitalizations, and it's great news. You know, hospitalizations are going down, uh, or they have gone down in the last two months. The problem is that number, that new number as of yesterday is 527. Um, we can't seem to get out of the 500 range. 90 days ago from today, we were at 271. When we were at 976 <clears throat> hospitalizations for COVID-19 back on 11-14, the state of Nebraska and the hospital association started developing what's called a critical plan. And a critical plan means it's a plan of ethics, of how we would approach who would receive care at what time if we went over a thousand, case, a thousand hospital beds being used for one diagnosis, that diagnosis being COVID-19. So, the number we've come off of 
is a critical, terrible number. The number that we're at, 527, is a bad number. The number we want to be at is below 80. And don't get me wrong, every staff member here would love to see us at that number, would love to see masks disappear. We've been doing this a long time. But we're at 527 today. We haven't been able to bounce off of that. We're pinging around the 500 mark. Um, that has created um, the, the governor to loosen up on some of the DHMs, so <clears throat> bigger gatherings and things like that going on um, going forward. And that, that concerns us some. So that's my point on, on hospitalizations. Um, here at MHCS, you know, I spent a lot of time talking a little bit about um, the new treatments that we have available, um, which has been a lifesaver for us in dealing with ER visits and inpatient stays. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that up to Dr. Kettner to spend a little more time talking about since he's more into, into that effort and understands it better than I do. But what we do understand is, you know, we are treating eight to nine people a week with this emergency um, uh, use approved drug. And it's made a big difference in what we're seeing in our ER and what we're seeing for admitted patients. We still have patients in our hospital that are being treated for COVID. We have patients today in our hospital being treated for COVID. As I said in my notes, um, the stress on a rural hospital is different than what you read in the paper or see in the news of the stress that's in these large hospitals. You see what's going on in California? It's a complete disaster. We don't want to be in that situation. But our stress in your rural hospitals are going to be dealing more with things like these outpatient basis, these outpatient items and approaches we're taking to try to keep people from getting deathly sick. We still want to figure out a way to keep people from ever getting the virus. That's what's most important. We can have these treatments and we can battle this with treatments, but we'd rather be in a, in a place where people just aren't getting the virus to begin with. So I hope uh, my explanation of how rural hospitals are managed and how many hospital beds we have and the fact that our work is shifting from probably ER type care to now this outpatient um, treatment of the more elderly population in order to keep them from getting to a dangerous stage with COVID-19. With testing, we continue to do testing six days, uh, seven, six days a week here in Seward, uh, seven days a week in the emergency room. Just an update on my numbers there. Last week, um, through our Test Nebraska site, which we offer Test Nebraska twice a, twice a week now, we tested over 100 people. I think it was about 104 people were tested um, through that. Through our system, Memorial Healthcare Systems, through our outpatient setting in the clinic and, and the ER, uh, where we test the symptomatic patients in a rapid test. Um, these are patients that are sick, that have symptoms. Uh, we did 51 uh, last week, and, and the positivity rate is what's very concerning to us. You saw in the document that I had a listing of positivity rates, and we were typically running in that 35% range most of the time. The last week, we saw a positivity rate, just ran the report today with lab. Uh, we're at a 53% positivity rate. With hey, Roger. Cases this last week. Yes. Hey, Roger, I'm going to have to stop you. I got you at past the five minute mark. We may come back with some questions, but right um, you got the if document. you want to go to Dr. Kettner, I think next, and then we can open it up to others. Can you hear me, Dr. Kettner? I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. go ahead. Yeah, I'm Dr. J.B. Kettner. I live at uh, 2562 Alvo Road here in Seward. I've been a doctor here for 23 years, a lot of you are familiar with me. Um, last time when I when I talked, the, the real focus, as Roger alluded to, was inpatient hospitalizations because we were nearing a critical threshold there and things have changed. I think kind of my role here is to provide you a, a clinical view of, of what's happening. And um, we still have a lot of hospitalizations, a lot more than we really should, but the, the focus has shifted somewhat. You know, it's not binary, it's not all or nothing, but the focus has shifted somewhat to intensive outpatient management of, of COVID now. Uh, Roger alluded to some newer treatments that we have. One of those is monoclonal antibody treatments, which have been a, a real game changer for at-risk patients, because what we're trying to do is drive down intensive care unit admissions and, and hospital admissions in general, and ultimately 
reduce the disability and the, the length of stay and, and ultimately the number of deaths from COVID. And so these monoclonal antibodies, um, we have under an emergency use, use authorization, um, they basically mimic what your immune system would do if you got COVID and had an appropriate immune response. And it's, it's somewhat complicated, but a simple version is in a lot of patients, particularly high risk patients, that immune response doesn't work correctly or is delayed. And so people get really sick and we have a chance to, to intervene here and take patients that we identify and we test and they test positive and we say, hey, you're high risk. We can sometimes even the same day, bring them into the hospital and do an outpatient infusion of these monoclonal antibodies. And it's, it's shown real promise in turning around these at-risk cases. And uh, it's really been, been important in reducing emergency room visits, hospital stays and ICU stays. And we're hoping it's gonna have an impact on, on mortality. Um, you know, it's very labor intensive to do this. And that's why I say that the focus has shifted somewhat to outpatient. So, you know, as an example, I look back since Halloween, my nurse Becky and I, you know, have identified people, you know, we contact them, they contact us, they have symptoms, we initiate that whole process and follow those patients closely. And we've had 80 patients, uh, which is basically November and December, that we've followed from testing through treatment and sometimes hospitalization and probably pro 20 or so of these monoclonal antibody treatments. And the results are good, but unfortunately some of those patients still have died. Um, and that's, that's 80 patients that we followed. I'm one of 10 physicians in our system. So, you know, you can kind of do the math on that. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of labor and those are lives. Those aren't just numbers. So, you know, I'm encouraged by that. You know, the vaccines are on the way. Um, you know, we healthcare workers have been vaccinated. We don't know exactly how the rollout's going to happen, but we're hoping, you know, in the very near future, we're going to be vaccinating the, the at-risk folks. And, and I just like to buy a little bit of time because, you know, ultimately it's those, those numbers of cases that come in. It's, it's, you know, people test positive and then everything else works out from there all the way down to the number of people in the ICU and the number of people on ventilators and the number of people that die. So, you know, I think one other maybe neglected area is not just, you know, there's easy stats to get a hold of, like how many people are in the hospital or what's your positivity rate, but there's also a, a certain amount of disability associated with, with COVID infection. And those are what we call our COVID long haul patients or long COVID patients. And, and we're starting to get some data on that. And it's looking like 10 to 15% of, of folks that are symptomatic, particularly in at-risk groups, end up having symptoms that last longer than a month. And that's a lot of morbidity and, and disability that's associated with this infection too, that isn't really viewable on a dashboard statistic kind of level. Um, the one other thing I guess I'd add clinically, you know, if you ask what, what concerns me probably most right now about COVID, it's um, the fact that we found a new variant, what a lot of people are calling the UK variant, which looks to be more transmissible. I, I wanna be clear, not more severe, like if you get it, you do worse, but it's just easier to transmit. And if we end up seeing that becoming the predominant um, strain that we see here in the US, which we probably will based on the international experience, that's gonna be challenging. And I think, again, it makes non-pharmaceutical interventions like masking and social distancing and all the things we're trying to do even more important. So, you know, I guess, that's what I'm, what I'm looking to do is reduce the input number, you know, the number of folks that get sick and then it drives everything, everything else there, you know, taking care of sick COVID patients is complicated. Um, and we're, we're happy to do that work, but, you know, wearing masks and doing social distancing is relatively simple. And I'm just thinking if we do the simple things, we have to do a lot less of the complicated things. So Dr. Kettner, if I could stop you here at five minutes, um, I guess one of my questions would be, and maybe for you or Roger, is, you know, the, the proposal or the recommendation, I guess, that came forward was to go through the month of, of February. And so that's why the date is the, after the first meeting in, in March. I mean, I mean, what do you hope, I guess, to accomplish by moving it out for another um, period of time to that, to that date? I mean, is it about waiting for vaccinations to be more widely available? Is, is it, you know, I, I guess, what, what are we hoping to see um, in the meantime? 
to, to justify or, or warrant the extension? Yeah, I guess I can, I can take that. You know, in my mind, it revolves a lot around the vaccines and we don't have a hundred percent timeline on vaccines, but I think it's important to keep in mind that when folks get vaccinated, it, it's not like the next day you're immune to, to COVID. So there's a, there's a lag time there. And, and even if we had a really robust immunization project that came out, you know, these are two shot series, two shot series, and it's going to take probably six weeks or so after the first vaccination to reach that 95% immunity level. It's not like a light switch. So, you know, there's a, there's a curve where your immunity builds, but you know, it's not like we vaccinate people and the next day we're okay. There, there's a lag time there where we still have to, you know, have, uh, you know, we've had folks that have been vaccinated, but then they got COVID because they just didn't have time to really develop the immunity. So, you um, know, th there's a lag time there. So, so when you uh, mentioned uh, earlier about, um, you know, trying to buy more time, that's what you're, I guess, referring to is is to buy more time for the vaccinations to be more widely available and, and more widely um, and that that rollout to be more more widely implemented to get to that point where you know for those at least and I assume the vaccination rollout will will focus on those who are either with healthcare professionals the most vulnerable in society whether it's age or or health um, is that fair I guess as, as to the buying the time is to try to ensure their safety as much as possible. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Okay. Mayor, could I get a moment yes. on that? Yeah, go ahead, Roger. Vaccines and maybe Laura McDowell will report on this as well. I think in my document, I did reference where we're sitting at with vaccines. As of tomorrow evening, we'll have completed 330 vaccinations uh, in the county. Um, we hope to have all 350 of our vaccinations that uh, are of our allotment completed by the end of the week, uh, which is phase 1A. Phase 1, also I want to report that the largest long-term care facility in our, in our town, Ridgewood, um, their residents were vaccinated mm -hmm. last week. Um, next week, other long-term care facilities will be vaccinated. So if you do the math six, six weeks out from those, uh, that very vulnerable population won't hit their highest immunity um, for at least six, like Dr. Kettner said, for at least six weeks out from that time. The next phase, phase 1B, which we hope to get started in the next couple of weeks, possibly three weeks, is 75 years and older. That's the next phase and the number one tier that the governor wants us to focus on. And again, a very vulnerable population, 75 and older. So that timing that we're talking about is give us more time with those vulnerables. Thank you for answering my question. Um, Laura, did you want to speak at this time or you're welcome to, and then we can go on to the general um, public who's um, participating this evening. Laura, welcome. Yes, thank I mean, you. Thank Mayor, you. if I can, I'll just note for those that are still jumping on, um, message me if you want to get in the queue. Greg Butcher, I'm under City of Seward. And I was going to note that Laura <laughs> was the next person in line. So we have uh, two others after Laura already signed up. Thank you. Welcome, Laura. Yep. Thank you for letting me um, speak with you again. My name is Laura McDougall. I'm uh, with, uh, I live in York, uh, Five Country Club Terrace in York, and serve as the Four Corners Health Director for, and I have been with Four Corners for about 17 years. Um, so that being said, I uh, appreciate very much all the, the information that was shared with you by uh, Memorial Healthcare System and Roger about this. The, um, I think the fact too, I wanna add, we have been working very, very hard planning this vaccine rollout and it is, is really top, top priority for us right now. We are, um, you know, as a state, not maybe the highest priority in the nation as to being supplied first with vaccine. Um, and as a, as a smaller health district, we are also not um, going to be getting the supplies that perhaps some other areas in Nebraska might be getting. We have been at this point only received um, for our entire district, we've received 1300 doses of vaccine. And so with a 45,000 populous um, health district that isn't going to be going very far. We have been getting in the last two weeks, 100 doses a week. So that 
that element of buying time is really critical. And we feel like, you know, in our quest to create more immunity in our population, this is the safest way to get that immunity and uh, is by vaccinating. So that being having time to get uh, and to work with the 75 and older population, we know we have probably 3,000 uh, of those people that are living in our district right now. So this is going to be a major lift for us. And Memorial Healthcare Systems is a key partner in that in taking care of the Seward community. So uh, in helping us get those vaccines out. So um, it's just really important that we have some time. When we last met and talked about masks, um, we were at a, in a really, as Roger said, a very dangerous place. And we have, um, you know, through a lot of hard work and some of these measures in place, we have gained a lot of ground and come off that peak now. And it's due to everything that people have been doing in the communities, including wearing masks, but it's a combination of all of these measures being taken together. It's important, but we have sort of leveled off now and are even seeing a little bit of uptick again following Christmas and New Year's. Um, we are leveling off and this is still, we're still at a significant transmission stage. We need some more time. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. And um, one example that, you know, we, we sort of are looking at is we're, we're halfway through the fight right now with um, reinforcements coming, um, we, which is the vaccine. We need some more time to be able to get them in place so we can continue this fight against the virus. Um, it's really important for these older and at-risk individuals that we have some more time. We would recommend definitely as Four Corners that this mask mandate be uh, extended. And it has just been a, a very effective tool for us. You've seen how effective all of these interventions have been coming off of the peak. And that's has driven this, this downward trend and we need to continue to keep these numbers moving downwards if we possibly can. Um, at the very least, we need to not go back in the, the wrong direction again. Um, so we just need your help. And this will get us more time than um, to, by extending this to vaccinate more people, help our schools and our local economy and our hospital to stay open as well. So thank you for your time. And that would be our recommendation. Laura, can I ask you a quick question? Um, you know, over this holiday season now, when, when we, we're gonna have college kids here in Seward coming back to campus, we're gonna have um, students at the public, or at all the local schools returning from Christmas break. Um, is there, I guess, a, I don't, I don't want to play chicken little here and say the sky is falling, but is there a, a concern, I guess, a kind of a wait and see of, is that going to impact the, the local COVID numbers in a way that, that you would be concerned about, I guess, looking at an extension to this mask mandate? Absolutely. Anytime, you know, our, our level of community transmission was much, much lower when we started school last fall and for the most part in the Seward community. You know, everyone was wearing masks when school started, which really helped. We saw, we saw, you know, they were effective in the schools. However, it's, there's still as many activities uh, associated with school and, but a lot of stuff was outside in the fall. And, you know, that also bought us some time. And we were really having troubles, um, you know, as we got closer to Thanksgiving, as we got close to Thanksgiving. And uh, you know we were seeing more and more transmission in the schools. And a lot of what happens in the schools is driven by community transmission. The numbers of, of, of what's happening in the schools is often driven by, we've been seeing the, what's going on in the community. So the fact that you know, this, now we're going to be inside and things are still pretty wide open in terms of directed health measures and uh, our community transmission is, is high already to start this time. I think everybody's very concerned. And then, you know, bringing everyone back together again in, in close conditions. So definitely there's some concerns. Okay. Thank you, Laura. 
Greg, did you want to take over now and start calling on people? Greg, I think you're muted. <laughs> Talking to myself here in this big room. Um, the chat feature still works. So if you want to get a hold of me at City of Seward, um, the first one I have up now on the list is Zach Soplin. And so I will track down Zach. Um, to give, oh, there he is. And so, all right, Zach, do we have you? Yep. Can you no. hear me? Yep. Awesome. Good deal. Am I good to start? Go ahead, Zach. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Zach Soflin, and I live at uh, 1528 238th Road. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to address the council tonight. Um, I want to make clear from the beginning that I'm, I'm not here to question the efficacy of masks themselves. I think that's probably a topic that we could all debate all night and still get um, nowhere. But um, I am here to, to question um, with facts the necessity and effectiveness of an ordinance requiring masks to be worn and uh, to voice my opposition to extending this ordinance. Um, I think with issues like this, I think it's really important um, when we're facing these types of tough situations, um, uh, like the one that we're in, that we uh, make these types of decisions based on facts. And I think, I think that's probably what everyone is trying to do. Um, but I think it's really easy to um, uh, make these types of decisions based on emotion and, and not facts. So I'm, I'm looking um, tonight to kind of share some of the facts surrounding um, um, some of the current trends in uh, daily cases of COVID-19 and also hospitalizations um, for our county um, and hopefully um, uh, accurately um, display kind of where we're at as a, as a community. Um, and so uh, um, I'll, I'll start by kind of um, saying the original ordinance uh, lists out as one of its primary reasons for requiring masks um, as follows. It says, uh, the increase of the spread of COVID-19 cases in the city of Seward creates an unacceptable risk to the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Seward. The wearing of face coverings by every individual while indoors in public spaces in the city of Seward will likely reduce community transmissions of COVID-19, potentially result resulting in fewer deaths serious health complications and aims to ease the strain on hospitals and other medical office facilities. So um, after, after reviewing, um, again, the, the trends in both uh, new cases of coronavirus and hospitalizations in our county, I don't think, I do not believe that the facts show that the mask mandate has had any impact on reducing the spread. And I don't believe the current numbers indicate a strain on our local healthcare system. Um, and uh, in order to, to kind of uh, um, bear this out, I'd like to discuss this, my reasoning um, behind this through a few key uh, charts. Um, so I realized sharing, sharing the screen is sometimes uh, complicated. So if you, if you just look at my uh, camera, you should be able to see instead of my face, the, um, the chart itself. Um, and so uh, the, uh, my camera on Zoom, sorry, apologies. Um, so this, this first chart that I, I kind of want to talk. Zach, just yeah. for those those of you that aren't, don't use Zoom a lot, if you try on your upper right-hand corner where it says view, if you change your view to speaker view, that will expand um, Zach's screen there so you can kind of get a better view. I have it open now and uh, you can kind of get a good view of what Zach has on his screen. So if you change to speaker view, that will help. Awesome, thanks, Greg. Um, so th this first graph, um, I want to I want to kind of talk about, um, uh, and but I'll kind of describe what it is first of all. This is a this is a chart taken directly from uh, the New York Times, um, and it is a, a chart of daily COVID nineteen cases for Seward County, um, ranging from October on the left hand side to uh, January on the right hand side. And so um, the bars, kind of in the background, what you're seeing is the actual um, daily cases of uh, um, COVID-19. And the black line represents kind of a seven day rolling average of cases. And so um, th that's, that's pretty typical in, in calculating these things because um, uh, um, days of the week, a lot of times uh, dictate, you know, uh, how, how uh, there, there's trends in days of the week. Um, so the, the seven day rolling average helps uh, kind of identify what these, what these trends are. Um, so uh, 
what I, and all I've done uh, with this graph is I kind of overlaid some key dates on um, uh, related to us in Seward County. Um, so starting at the left hand side, um, you can see the, the first date I kind of called out there is October 20th. Um, October 20th, we had uh, six, an average of six cases per day of COVID-19. That was originally the date of the city council meeting where um, the mask mandate was uh, rejected for various reasons. Um, you can see as we move uh, to the right on the graph that um, we see a significant increase in daily cases um, here, leading all the way up to November 10th, where we saw an average of 19 cases uh, per day. That was the peak um, at that point. Now, what, what's important to note here is that um, uh, the daily cases immediately turned downward and fell drastically over the next um, three weeks or so, three or four weeks um, uh, from that point. That was before any mask mandate or other um, restrictions um, were in place. And you, you'll notice as I move to the right-hand side, there's a blue dotted line that indicates um, where we can start to look at um, the daily cases and see where the mask mandate would actually begin kind of its eff effectiveness. Right, like um, December 3rd is when the mask mandate was passed, December 5th was when it was impl implemented. And um, considering incubation period of between two and 14 days um, with the um, uh, several, several different studies have indicated the, the median incubation period to be about 5.1 days. So if you take December 5th um, plus five days, that's where you end up with that, that date of December 10th of where we can really start to see the impact or lack thereof of any type of mask mandate. Now, I, I recognize that, that, um, uh, that there are obviously a ton of variables going into this. What I'm trying to do here is represent as accurately as possible um, uh, what, what is actually impacting these numbers. Because what you'll notice on the right-hand side of the blue dotted line, um, the uh, cases, daily cases went down um, slightly further from eight. And then we saw another um, uh, um, uh, spike, uh, a smaller spike this time, and then came back down to, again, on January 2nd, uh, an average of six cases um, per day. I think Zach, I don't yes. mean to cut you off. I have you past five minutes. Um, can I just have you finish your thought real quick? Yeah, sure. No, my, uh, my, my, my entire point here. Um, even even looking at um, these daily cases and also at hospitalizations, I won't I won't move on to that graph because I'm, I'm out of time. But um, uh, all of those all of those uh, um, numbers fell prior to the mask mandate being in place, and we didn't see any significant drop afterwards. So I, I would I would uh, urge the council to um, consider these facts before extending the mask mandate because it does put um, a burden on its citizens, and if the numbers don't bear um, out a reason for keeping that in place, I would say um, we need to let the ordinance sunset. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you, Zach. Yep. All right, Mayor. Next, I have just in order to give some heads up, I have Christy, Allie, and Terry are the next three up. Um, and we're going to go to Christy Ideas. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Christy. Hey, uh, Christy Ideas, 1990 Rainbow Avenue here in Seward. Um, our numbers are going down prior to the mask mandate like um, Zach showed in his graph there, and they are continuing to go down. We didn't hit the huge spike at, from Thanksgiving gatherings that took place, and the virus is doing what a virus does. It spikes up, then it goes down, then it spikes up again a little bit, and it goes down. Um, it's a virus, we can't run and hide from it. No matter what we do, we just have to find a way to live life with this virus without having lockdowns, mask mandates, and restrictions. Um, we haven't done any of these things in the, with the flu in previous years, and the flu still kills more people each year. Just days after our mask mandate went into effect in December, Governor Ricketts eased the restrictions in the statewide DHM, making masks a suggestion in areas where they were required before. Our hospitals and healthcare aren't overwhelmed with this virus, and you can't say they are when you don't show the data from previous years at the same time of year to, to, to compare it to. The mask mandate is based on four corners risk style, which is determined by four counties, not just Seward County or Seward community. If we're going to look at science, then let's look at all of the science, even science that proves it's not healthy to make healthy people wear a mask, have those who are vulnerable wear a mask if they choose. 
It's been shown in towns in our state and other states that when the government takes the power away from its citizens, it doesn't like to give it back very easily. Be the government that starts to prove this fact differently. Give the power back to the citizens of Seward and let them decide if they want to wear a mask. People who want to wear one can and most likely will. 90% of COVID positive individuals are asymptomatic. This is the most significant and meaningful statistic of all. Numerous studies have been done proving that asymptomatic people aren't spreaders of the virus if they have sick, if you're sick or have symptoms then stay home. Asymptomatic COVID positive have a spread rate of only 0.7%, less than 1%. They are not super spreaders. The survival rate of ages zero to 69 is 99.82%. And the survival rate of 70 plus is 94.6%, even with high comorbidities and other causes of death. The masks being mandated to wear are scientifically proven to not work against a virus, according to studies, the WHO and Dr. Anthony Fauci. In addition to 10 months of people wearing them, showing no better rate of cases than states and countries that have not worn them. Plus 85% of people who tested positive were mask wearers. The CDC also reported no significant reduction of influenza transmission with the use of face masks. Hence, they don't work for COVID either. Masks do not prevent the slow or spread of COVID-19. Have you read the packages that the masks of the kids are wearing to school? They're for fashion and don't help prevent the spread. The virus particles are small enough to still enter through a mask. In the 2017 to 18 flu season, there were 810,000 hospitalizations, far surpassing the COVID hospitalizations for the entire year. Over 61,000 people died. There were 195 pediatric deaths due to influenza, far greater than what has been reported for the COVID-related pediatric deaths. No lockdowns, restrictions, social distancing, or masks were required during that time. There has never been a sample specimen of SARS-CoV-2 isolated and purified, and the inventor of the PCR and other scientists have always said the PCR test should not be used for medical diagnostics. It will produce false positives, and Dr. Fauci has confirmed that the cycle threshold on the test is too high, which creates false positives. So my question to the council members, have each of you worn a mask everywhere you've gone in Seward since the mandate went into place, including the places where it was not required due to the type of business it was? So I'm asking that you let this mandate sunset tomorrow when it was originally planned to be and let the restrictions be eased up on our table. Thank you. Greg, I think you're muted again. <laughs> All right. Um, next, I have Allie, I believe. Allie, Hello. You yep. Go ahead. All right, hi everybody. My name is Allie French. Uh, I was asked to join tonight just to share a few things with you guys. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna make it absolutely clear that nowhere in the constitution does it promise anybody an ICU bed. That right there alone should stop anything from happening because we are not a country built on one service. The medical establishment, the medical health care system is one service and you don't stop everything for one service and be damned the rest of the, your community. It, it, the community doesn't thrive that way. We, it is, it's been made perfectly clear before Christy had mentioned that asymptomatic spread has never been proven. There has not been a single obser clinical observation of asymptomatic spread. It's never happened. Restricting healthy people is unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional in the U.S. in the I'm sorry, the Nebraska Constitution, Article Three, um, which it goes into discrimination and the dissent of people that should have be allowed in public places. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place tonight. <laughs> um, my point being, guys, is that we don't mandate health. People have the right to choose their own treatment. People have the right to deny the treatment of the healthcare community and you guys don't get to force it on them. Even Supreme Court Justice Alita has stated that the coronavirus pandemic has created the most invasive circumstances on our civil liberties. We wouldn't have Supreme Court justices making these statements if what the local communities were doing was legal. It's also stated under the US law for ordinances in municipalities that the ordinance that you create must be direct. It must stop crime. 
which means you are stating that any person who doesn't put on a mask is a criminal. And what you're doing then is forcing business owners to decide whether their own neighbor is a criminal or if they have a legitimate reason why they can't be wearing one. And right there, creating dissent in your community is reason not to pass a mandate. Creating dissent in your community in, in a law is unconstitutional. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, I'd like to use my husband as an example. He uh, just got the all clear and beat cancer for the second time this year during a pandemic, for which I wasn't able to attend any of his meet any of his appointments. Guys, he had to go by himself. Do you know how scared he was to have to listen to whether he was cancer free or not by himself? COVID didn't do this to us, guys. The government did. These restrictions did. But it wasn't COVID. You guys should be having your 4th of July party here in the few months. Instead, you guys are going to be dealing with these silly mask restrictions instead of having your party and celebrating the freedoms of this country. We shouldn't be wondering whether you're going to be allowed to have a parade. Guys, it's the United States of America. Live. Have your parade. Get on with your lives. Allow businesses to prosper. While, while businesses are going under and people are losing their livelihood, the hospitals are getting millions and millions and millions of dollars from our government. They aren't suffering. And if they are, it's because of their own policies. They are the ones hiring out-of-towners that literally, guys, some of these out-of-state nurses get $11,000 a week. $11,000 a week. Yeah, they may be tired. But at least they can pay their bills. My husband can't even get work because nobody's going to hire a man whose lungs are damaged from cancer and can't wear a mask. Unless we go through the third party and have go through a whole bunch of doctor's appointments, who's going to pay for that? Us? We don't have any money. So who is really, who are we really hurting here? The healthy people who want to contribute to society and work. You're making their lives more difficult. A mask mandate does nothing but destroy your guys' economy and create dissension between your neighbors. I, I absolutely want to insist that you guys allow this mandate to sunset and move on. Thank you so very much, guys, for having me. Have a good evening. Hey, Allie, Allie yes, before sir. you go, could you state your address for us? We didn't catch yes, it. Yes, absolutely. 4213 North 172nd Street in Omaha. Okay, thank you. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yes. appreciate your comments. Greg, uh, can you up the participant level? I think we're at 100. I'm working on it. I don't. I think Zoom changed their program again. So I will uh, work on it while we move through some of our more participants. Um, currently, next up, I have Terry Hobson. Terry, are you available? Yes, I am. All right, go ahead, Terry. Hi, I'm Terry Hobson. Um, I reside at 1356 Fairlane Avenue here in Seward. And I'm the owner of a business here in Seward called TNT Crafts and Boutique. And um, I have to first off agree with what Zach had said with the numbers, you know, up and down and stuff. And I guess there's things that I've looked into. I've talked to some nurses that I've known and et cetera. And I guess it's just, crazy to me that I still, it's hard for me to, to understand this. Um, I'm another one who I guess I feel it's, it's a virus. It has to run its course. And I, I had someone ask me if my business has turned around since we have had masks. No. So there's your answer for that. I have not seen an increase in business. I mean, I, so I mean, honestly, no, the mask isn't making more people come into my store. Um, also, I still think it's so unfair as a business owner that I feel like I have to be a mask police. As I look around in this group and I wonder how fair do you guys all feel that you ha have a job where you're still collecting a paycheck? Do you think I'm collecting a paycheck? No. So think about that. Think about a family. 
okay? Think about our rights as human beings. Freedom. My, my six-year-old will tell you, freedom. I preach to my children, we don't live in fear and I don't care. Everyone can say it's not fear. It is. We're being taught to live in fear. Let's stand up for our rights, our freedoms. Where did it come to where we as human beings cannot just make our choice? If, for, for instance, one of you council members, you decide that you're gonna mask up and go out to a business, that's fine. I'm not gonna kick you out of my store, but I'm also not gonna kick someone out of my store if they come in and ask if they have to wear it. It's your choice. I'm not the police. I'm not going to tell my customers, put on a mask. I won't do it. The rage that I have lived, it's disgusting what us people had to go through to, to explain to our kids what it's like to be under stress every day every day and i feel as jessica sits with a smoldering look on her face shame on you tell me what it's like when my six-year-old child said that i don't want to go back to school mom what are we doing you guys have you thought of this? Have you thought of the freaking crap we go through as mothers? The depression is real. Ask me. It's real. So is it okay, Dr. Kendner, that I come to the ER saying I'm ready to take my own life? Are you going to say, no, you have to be tested for COVID? Answer the questions. When are we going to stop? It's all about COVID. Yeah. And I'm probably going to have a lot of people look down at me. And that's fine. But I will stand up for my rights, my freedom, my kids, and their future. Think about it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Terry. Greg? Yeah, I did. Um, Zoom seems to like to nickel and dime us, but I did get it updated again to an even more expensive one. Thank them. Uh, so if you are getting contacts by anybody that wants to jump on, let them know that we're still on and available. Uh, I don't know who... I think we have another Softlin and I'm gonna find them. I don't know the first name, but I'm gonna unmute because I can find them. Okay. You got Are it. you there? Hey there. there Am I up? Yes, go ahead and identify yourself, state your address for the record, and you're ready to go. Okay. I'm Bethany Softlin. I live at 1528 238th Road here in Seward. And I just wrote out something because I'm not a very good speaker speaker, but I'll go ahead. Um, it has been said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Here's the thing. No one wants to see people harmed. No one on the city council. No one speaking here tonight. I don't know everyone's heart, but I bet I'm right about that. What has happened in our country this last year has not been fun for anyone. I admire healthcare professionals sacrificing their time and talents for our community. I admire their dedication, and I want people to be vigilant with their health and not take stupid risks. What has happened this last year within the United States with different state and city governments locking people in their homes, enforcing outdoor mask mandates at all times, telling people to wear masks even in their homes, telling businesses what they can and can't sell and limiting them in other ways they can't possibly survive as a response to COVID has been hard to watch. Many, many people in this town are paying attention to those developments and do not want to see us approach anywhere close to other places in the United States. 
I hear many people say things like, what's the big deal? It's just a mask. I agree. It is relatively easy to slap a piece of fabric on your face. It is not, however, easy to keep that fabric clean according to the guidelines of the CDC. I imagine any efficacy of masks is compromised if we're not following those guidelines. Did you know you are not supposed to touch your mask while wearing it? This is all I see people do. With no masks, there's a relatively good chance that if I touch a door handle, the last person who touched it didn't just touch their mouth or nose. With the mask ordinance, it's very likely whoever touched the door had just adjusted their mask before touching it. I would take my chances with only those trained and invested in wearing masks correctly to wear masks. I feel like we'd have much less mouth and nose juice on everything. And I won't get into every scenario, but with such a strict ordinance as the one we have and the judgment it confers on the maskless, I am sure there have been many people who have retrieved masks that have fallen on the floor, street, or used an old one that got sweaty last week so as not to break the ordinance or be looked at sideways. I know I've personally been in that position in restrooms. I have multiple young children and masks have fallen on bathroom floors and I'm left to contemplate, am I going to get, get looked at wrong if I don't put this back on my kid? Obviously, I did not. But anyways, when those things happen and people are putting those masks back on, it is no longer about the health of individuals in our community, but about compliance. There is one thing that sets our country apart from other nations, and that has been our freedom. We have always been proud of those freedoms in this city, of the revolution that occurred when people bravely made their own way and celebrated the fact that they were responsible to God and to each other but they were free not to fall in line with what every other country around them was doing. To dictate the way we breathe while out in our community is a substantial thing. I urge you to reconsider extending this ordinance. I urge you to let it sunset. We can debate the science, and that's my point. The efficacy of masks has not been demonstrated beyond doubt, and the possibility of asymptomatic spread is not holding up well under scrutiny. Communities with the heaviest restrictions are not the most COVID free. Declines do not consistently happen after mask and other mandates. It did not happen here. I urge you to extend the mask or, or to not extend the mask ordinance. I urge you to risk freedom. And that's all I have. Thanks, Bethany. Um, next I have uh, Dana Sievers. All right. Do I have you? Can you hear me? You're ready to go. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dana Sievers and I live at 222 Wildwood Road uh, here in Seward. And I just have two quick things that I want to say and hopefully I can squeeze it in. Um, first of all, I am the one who set up the um, petition that we just ran um, just to see like what the community, I was real interested in finding out like what, how the community felt. And um, I'm, I'm obviously opposed to extending the mandate. Um, and I felt there was probably a lot of other people who were too. Um, so we decided to put a petition together and put it out there. And as of uh, tonight, there's 586 signatures um, we were not able to print the signatures and turn them in uh, because we found out late in the afternoon that um, depending on where you were when you signed, it actually listed that location as your address. So the Hackbarts, for example, were in somewhere in Iowa. <laughs> and so all whoever in their family had signed all showed up as Iowa. So if I didn't know the person personally, I couldn't verify their signature as a resident of Seward. So what we're going to have to do it before we submit it to the city um, is, and we are going to do that, but we want to make sure we're accurate. We don't want to count people that signed from Minnesota if they don't live here in Seward or work here or go to church here or shop here or go to school here. So we're going to, we're going to scrub that uh, data really cleanly and make sure we don't turn in, in any false signatures. But I did want to point out, we put that um, petition together Saturday night at 11 p.m. It posted 
And as of tonight, it's at 586 signatures and climbing. And I think that's a pretty good representation of our community and where we're at. And we also submitted comments. I don't know if you guys got them, but I'm hoping you're getting email alerts because I've got you set up to receive them. Um, I really hope you'll read those comments and you'll read our, and I know you, you know, hopefully have read our letters. So um, we will, that's to be continued. We're not gonna close this, we're not gonna close the petition yet for a couple of days because a lot of people were just finding out about it. I've been getting calls all day, like, wait, wait, I didn't get to sign. So I decided to leave it open. Um, but it, we, like I said, we are at 586. Um, also just in like real quick, I would like to address the flu issue because I'm super, super offended. And I feel like my intelligence is being completely insulted by everybody in the media and in our hospital system and our physicians who are like trying to tell us that we have no flu. I'm gonna tell you why we have no flu, okay? My children have been sick with something really bad. So Gemma, my daughter, uh, we sent her in for a COVID test. She was very sick, very, very sick. She had to be sent home from Concordia. She could not run track. She was very, very ill. She tested negative for COVID. Do you think that anyone called her to say, hey, come back in, let's test you for something else. Let's test you for influenza A, influenza B. How about strep throat? No, nobody is doing that. My daughter, Gracelyn, has to take a COVID test to go back to her university at Baylor next week or in a couple of weeks. And so she is very sick right now. She's feeling terrible. So we sent her over today to get a COVID test. Guess what? She's negative. And guess what? Nobody called her back to say, well, if you're negative for COVID, let's test you for something else. Do you have strep? Do you have influenza A? Do you have influenza B? Nothing. And this is happening over and over and over in our community. So please, please do not insult my intelligence and tell me that the flu has disappeared. That is crazy. Half the stuff that we're seeing are false positives and we're probably just picking up flu. The asymptomatic stuff is real. The new data that's coming out is making a very strong case for the fact that asymptomatic spread is just not a thing. It's not what we thought it was. And the whole reason we're be being told to wear masks is because asymptomatic spread would be a big problem, right? And so of course I wanna protect my neighbor. I wanna protect, you know, if that was a thing, then yes, we should do it. But it's clearly the Wuhan study, and I sent that in to all of you. I hope you'll read it. And if you want to debate it with Dr. Kettner, you want to debate it with other physicians, fine. Um, but it should be it should be talked about. Like you can't make these decisions and do this to us and not address the current science. If asymptomatic spread is not a thing, then we need to take the masks off and for, and just move on. So I'm getting hit. Okay, one minute. No, I'm done. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I need to hire your timekeeper. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Greg? Next, I have Reagan Hain. I have to find Reagan on here. There she is. There you go, Reagan. Go ahead. Thanks, Greg. I'd like to say thank you to the city council members and thank you for all of the participants that are on the Zoom this evening. Uh, I spoke a couple meetings ago about my disdain for a mask ordinance. Um, at that time, it was not passed. Um, I was unaware that it was on the last city council agenda until the meeting was actually occurring. Um, I hope Dr. Kettner is still on. Um, I actually um, contracted COVID in late October. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about my health history, um, only because I need people to understand that I'm an American citizen. I have freedoms and I have rights. Um, I was diagnosed with two heart conditions since COVID. Um, I did not actually get to meet my cardiologist until about three weeks ago when I had to go in for a procedure. Um, because of COVID, my the two cardiologists that I did get to speak with, it was telehealth visits. Um, 
I have underlying conditions. I have medically significant underlying health conditions and I contracted COVID. I'm 39 years old. I was extremely ill. I ended up in the emergency room, ended up with um, some damage to my left lung. Um, I am one of those people in that area that speaks or that Dr. Keckner was describing as people who continue to have complications. I'm one of those people. I am two months post having COVID. I continue to rehabilitate myself. There was very little follow-up after I had contracted COVID because nobody wanted to see me because I was in quarantine. So working in the medical field, I have doing what I knew I needed to do for myself and learning a lot from Dana Sievers on what I needed to do for myself to be able to rehabilitate myself from this. Um, I, I don't agree with a mask mandate. I, it didn't keep me from getting COVID. Um, I got it. I'm like I said, I'm still rehabilitating. I would say I'm probably 90% of where I was. I still don't agree with it, even though I've had it. I, I just can't, it's my right. It's my right to be able to wear a mask or not wear a mask. I don't understand why somebody else gets to choose what I can and cannot do. It's my right to walk out that door. I could be a hit by a car tomorrow. I am not going to let fear. I'm not going to let fear keep me from living my life. I'm not going to let it keep me from helping my children and encouraging them to speak up for themselves. And I do have to say, you know, with other health conditions that I have, I'm actually exempt from wearing a mask. I don't have to wear it, but I will tell you, I have walked into Walmart and I've been called a murderer. I've been told that I need to put my mask on to save a life. And just so people are aware, I don't respond. I don't respond. I, I don't, but I, I don't understand how other people can decide for me what I need to be doing for my own body. I've contracted it. I have it. I'm not going to get a vaccine. My children are not going to get vaccines. And I want to, there's one other point that I want to make because um, there was a comment being made. I believe it was um, from Roger Reamer about California and the hospitalizations. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the small town that I grew up in is roughly the size of Seward. It's very, very similar. The population is about 7,000 people. Based on what's going on and the shutdowns that are occurring in California, 25 to 30% of the small businesses in the small town that I grew up in have gone out of business and they will not reopen. So the mandates and the ordinances that have been put in place on small towns, they have not been effective. And I can tell you that these mandates are not helping with their numbers either. Their numbers are continuing to rise. That's what's gonna happen with a virus. It's out there, people are going to get it. People are gonna get sick. They're going to build immunity to this. That's what we do with all other viruses. And I, Really, I am asking the council, please allow this ordinance to sunset. Please do not move forward with this ordinance. Thank you. Reagan, for the record, can you give your address? I'm sorry, Greg. Yes, 3456 Branch Oak Road, Staplehurst. Thank you. Um, at this time, Mayor, I don't have anyone else in the queue. Um, we want to see if there's. I would love to speak if that's okay. I'm trying to figure out how to get in the call or hey, talk, got, but I got I just... somebody. Yes, I'm here. I'd love to be able to speak. Is this? I'm going to take a guess because of the area code. Is this Dr. Tapper? This is. There we go, Dr. Tapper. Can you give us your name and address, and then we'll let you go. Yeah. Um. Actually, I'm super impressed that you knew it was me. That's crazy. But uh, yes, uh, my name is Ben Tapper. Uh, my address, 16909 Burke Street, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I am a doctor of chiropractic that I specialize in. Uh, you know, I, 
immunology, epigenetics, and I, I put on flu workshops, and I talk about how there's a lot of manipulation and data with influenza numbers, uh, and I've been studying the National Vital Statistics Reporting System for the CDC for over a decade. I talk about how there's manipulation of data every year, every year, every year, but my words fall on deaf ears. And, you know, by speaking out as much as I have, I put my reputation on the line. I put my practice on the line. I know what it sounds like to speak out against this. And, you know, the Bible states that where your treasure is, your heart will also be. If my treasure was in making money, I'd have a mask on and keep my mouth shut. But... My treasure is in truth and integrity and in serving the people. And I'm going to tell you that we have manipulation of data on a global scale, and that should send a shiver down everyone's spine that's listening. We have influenza being combined, not only with pneumonia, but they do that every year. They have been for over a decade with bacterial and viral pneumonia, they do this to prop up the, the flu deaths, but the real killer is the pneumonia. COVID-19 is no different. They're now com combining these numbers on the National Vital Statistics Reporting System for the CDC. They're combining COVID with influenza A, B, and now bacterial and viral, viral pneumonia. The influenza has seemed to just up and disappear. Other people have mentioned that, but that is reality. Why is that? I have a family member, I refrain from giving his name, but he's the CFO of a very large hospital. He told me that the, co the hospital numbers are not even pre-COVID numbers. If this is the deadliest pandemic of all time, shouldn't the hospitals be overflowing? He said that the tent that was put out in front of his hospital had, a, had zero patients. It was all for display and show. It was all theater. And that's the same across the nation. Why is that happening? Why are we being lied to? I have zero tolerance for, for uh, propaganda manipulation. The people that are pushing for these mask mandates, they're not my enemy. These people are caring, loving people that want to protect others. I admire that. But what the thing is, there's a bigger agenda at play. Benjamin Rush tried to warn us. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He stated, unless we put medical freedoms into the Constitution, the time will come. When medicine forms into an undercover dictatorship, restricting the art of healing to one class of men. And I believe that time is now. Thomas Jefferson stated that if the government, <coughs> excuse me, if the people decide or let the government decide what foods they eat, what medicines they take, their bodies will soon be in a sorry state of those souls who live under tyranny. We need to be careful with this mandate because I believe this is a slippery slope into that medical dictatorship. The ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices last year stated that they cannot force vaccinate, but they can force compliance. How are they going to do that? This is much bigger than a virus. I believe that this is a, a, a shift in our society as, as the way we, this is a shift in our society into a global agenda. Do not be fooled by that. I have spent I can't even tell you thousands and thousands of hours in research studying this. We need to be very leery about this agenda that's coming our way. We need to be very careful. I beg you people, listen to your people. Err on the side of freedom. Benjamin Franklin said, if you're willing to give up freedom for temporary security, you will lose both. You need to research the Great Reset, the Global Reset. Why is this occurring on a global scale? Why do we have lockdowns and mandates on a global scale? These lockdowns and mandates are causing more harm than good. Suicide is an all-time high. I've gotten people shame me, saying, no, you don't wear a mask. I wear a mask because if it just saves one life, it's worth it. Then why don't you save those in the nursing homes that are trapped like prisoners? Loneliness will kill them faster than COVID-19 will heartbreaking to me people wake up this is a dictatorship agenda being played out with military precision and this freedom this is this affects our children's children's freedom so i beg you i pray that the fear lifts the veil over your eye lifts the veil over your eyes 
Fear will blind you to this. That's why Roosevelt said the only thing to fear is fear itself, because he knew that fear would blind, blind us from the enemy. So I pray, I pray, I pray, wake up and see that this is at our doorstep. We don't have medical freedom. We have a dictatorship knocking at our door. You vote yes to this mandate. You just let him in. That's all I have. Thank you, doctor. Greg, I think you're muted again. Uh, currently, I don't have anyone else in the queue. We did receive uh, a question that just, I think some people may not have caught when Roger spoke. Oh, I have another one, but real quick, Roger, did you give any specific Seward Memorial Healthcare hospitalization numbers? And I can un unmute Roger. <laughs> Oh, Roger disappeared. Now he's back. Oh, sorry, Roger. We, we're playing the button game. Go one more time. There, I think I'm unmuted now. Greg, um, I, I don't know if I understand your question. You're talking about what our numbers are at the hospital in regards to occupancy or what's the yes. question? Yes. Um, it was a question that came out. I think it was somebody that didn't catch in the quick review of yours. We obviously went over state numbers. Yeah. And that state numbers are down and kind of plateaued in regards to COVID patients uh, in active beds. Right. Um, they were asking about Seward specific numbers. And sure. do we have those numbers and been tracking those? I'll turn that over to you. Yeah. And I think in my statement, if I had a chance to read it, I did try to explain in a, what a rural setting looks like in regards to inpatient care and outpatient care and things like that. Our current um, census and occupancy is very similar to where it's been last year. And one of the reasons I put in there is because we aren't diagnosing flu cases that are hospitalized. We're just not seeing the flu. I agree with what everybody's saying. The flu is out there. It's just not being transmitted as much as it has been in the past. So what we've done is we've replaced inpatient occupancy with COVID patients, which are much more resource intensive, longer length of stays, more resources used by the staff, um, those type of things. So typically, you know, if I gave numbers, I guess I'd have to have people understand what an occupancy rate means in a rural hospital. So if today I said we have six swing bed patients, okay, a swing bed patient can be in the hospital from 10 days to 85 days to 90 days. They're here for rehab, okay? So today we got six swing beds. We've also got two COVID inpatients. We've also got an observation patient. We also have 134 patients that came through the door today for outpatient care and another 14 that came through the ER. So I'm trying to explain what do people wanna know about what the strain is. The strain is the COVID patient in an outpatient setting, in a COVID patient, in an inpatient setting, is a much different strain on our resources than non-COVID patients. So I'm hoping I'm making that statement correctly. I don't know how else to explain it to you. You know, we're a 24-bed hospital. Critical access hospitals can't have more than 25 beds. I'm just stating the facts. 80% of our business is outpatient. 20% of our business is inpatient. So that's what I can tell you. That's what we've got for patients. If somebody has a good understanding of how that works, then they'll understand it. Otherwise, it's in my notes. I've explained it as to how we have to manage for inpatient stays and what type of cases are in rural hospitals. I hope that helps. If I want to get more specific, that's about as specific as I can get on that. I think we'll turn it over if there's any additional questions that will come from the council, Roger, but I wanted to clarify that because it was okay. brought up. We had a few people that hadn't jumped on. Um, next. Greg, I think you're muted again. Yep. Okay, sorry. A lot of buttons going on here. Next we have, I believe, Cindy. Uh, and I'll see if I can find Cindy. Hey, I'm here. Are you there, Cindy? Thank Hi. you so much. Go ahead. Cindy Fossler, 1660 North 2nd Street. I, I do live in Seward. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to the council members who have supported the mask initiative. Though, um, you know, I, I do feel it's needed to protect our most vulnerable people. I, um, I also feel very strongly um, that we should listen to people who are credentialed experts living in our area who are seeing the actual data. I hold two HR credentials and I, I would be um, 
it would be difficult for me to sit through a meeting with an HR topic, um, having somebody who's not an expert in that field tell me facts and figures. So I do want you to know, I appreciate that. I encourage you to listen to our local physicians and health department when you make your decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, In regards to those asking to speak, we currently don't have anyone in the queue. Uh, wait a few more seconds. In the meantime, as we discussed earlier, uh, once we get to the end of this kind of public comment portion, I'm gonna allow the whole system to be unmuted for a second. And uh, we'll see if anybody participating by phone or anything else wants to jump on with us. Uh, and have a few words and identify themselves again, your name and address. Mayor, I'm not getting anything in the chat. So if you want me to, I'll go ahead and open it up. Yep, go ahead and see if anyone else on the phone wants to participate. All right, we're gonna see how all this works. Uh, I'm gonna mute all then possibly unmute all. Let's, let's see what happens here, everyone, I apologize. Let's see. Oh, I saw one goodbye. Right. I have it set up now that if you do want to speak still, you can actually unmute yourself. Um, okay. And so if there's anyone that'd like to speak, Go ahead and just identify yourself first and then we'll sort them out. But first one that jumps up, I'm gonna uh, go with. So is there anybody that- This is Steve Hudson. Steve, all right, Steve. Uh, can you give us your address? Uh, this is Dave Hudson. Oh, Dave Hudson. All right, Dave, can you give us your address? 202 Maple Street. All right, Dave, go ahead. I'm very much for the extending the date on the mask mandate. Uh, we were promised 20 million doses of vaccine by the end of the year. We're lucky if we even gotten a tenth of that uh, total nation. You, what, was it 1,500 or something like that for Seward County? And we got 6,600 in the town itself. It's gonna be months before we get ahead of it with the vaccinations. And I can speak from our neighborhood. This summer, we had people that weren't social distancing and I can name you three different families that have gotten COVID. One of them, only one person out of the family got it. The other one was four out of five got COVID. The youngest one didn't. And I'm over 65 and I'm worried about catching it from somebody. I earlier in the year, I went to Walmart and you hardly had anybody wearing it. Now that you had the mask mandate, you had a lot more people, not everybody, but everybody's talking about their freedom. It's my freedom to wear the mask. It's my freedom not to get sick from somebody that does. So, I mean, what's going to hurt? A mask isn't that big a deal. You're not losing your total freedom by wearing a mask. It's a simple thing and it can help. And then you had people saying the flu disappeared. Nobody's ever said the flu disappeared. People get the flu uh, vaccination yearly and people still get the flu. It's going to be the same with this COVID vaccinations. It's going to take what data I've heard is after you get the second shot, it takes like 10 days into it, five to 10 days before you get the maximum amount of immunity from the shot. So I would like to see us go through the march. I'm thinking that the march isn't even going to be good enough unless something really happens with the, the political upheaval that's going on right now. So I would very much like the council to vote to extend the mandate. 
Thank you. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, I do have a request uh, from Jesse on the chat. I'm gonna try and check amongst all of our people uh, where Jesse is. So give me just one second. Where's Ulysses? Oh, yes, Staples. And in the meantime, is there anybody else that's participating by phone or unable to utilize the chat that would like to speak? Go ahead and state your name while I search for Jesse uh, in our list of, and I apologize, some of these are mixed in with the council members. And so, um, Jesse, if you are on, go ahead and unmute yourself. I can't catch you amongst the ones we have. Oh, I see you, there we go. Jesse, are you available? Yep, I'm here. Go ahead. Can you hear me? You're good. My name is Jesse Enfield. I live at 333 South 9th here in Seward. And I I had a question just if they can answer it, great. If they can't, that's cool too. My question is how many influenza tests have been given this year versus last year? And how can we compare that data if the tests are not being given as suggested earlier? The other thought I had is, okay, we have 580 some signing a petition to not wear masks. Are they really gonna jump in line to get a vaccine? I know for myself, nope, not gonna be jumping in line to get a vaccine. I can't speak for anybody else. And for some people, I do wanna say that it is a big deal to wear a mask it's encumbering it's claustrophobic it is a triggering mechanism for some people and the narrow-mindedness of not understanding how other people have issues is where a big part of the problem comes in and the lack of understanding after the last mass or when the mask mandate went into effect People were very, very, very vicious in this town. People were unrecognizable in the manner that they spoke to one another in this town. It is not the town that I came to love and have continued to stay in because I think it's best for my children. The things that were said to one another were awful. And that is something I think was not exactly foreseen that people would be so vicious to one another. And it's something we also need to weigh in. I, I do find it highly dubious that there are 27 cases of flu, influenza in the United States. I just don't buy it. After working in ERs for six years, no, I'm sorry, we had flu cases out the wazoo. I don't think it disappeared just because of masks. I don't think it disappeared because people don't don and doff masks appropriately. And when they are wearing the masks, they're not socially distancing. And the fact that we have to be told to wash our hands, ew, come on people, grow up, wash your hands. This should not be a new thing. This should have been done for years. This should have been done, taught as children. The fact that it has to be told now, just ew. You know, this a lot of this is just common sense and take care of yourself. If you wanna wear a mask, great, but don't force everybody. That's all I got. Thanks, Jesse. Um, Mayor, I don't have anyone else. Uh, we have given an opportunity or anyone that's participating by phone to kind of speak up and, and say stuff. Um, and so uh, if you want me to turn it back over to you, I might have to go through and unmute some of you guys and the council members uh, again after my 
mass muting that was going on there. So I apologize. Um, but Mary, I'll turn it back over to you at this point. Sure. Um, as Greg unmutes the uh, council members, this will be an opportunity for the council to ha ask any questions or make any comments that they'd like. I do have a question for Dr. Kettner, if he'd be willing to answer a question. Um, my question is about the, I'll call it the UK variant. Um, one, one of the constituents reached out to me and asked, are, how are we identifying that? Um, in that, you know, we're hearing that this is possibly happening here in the United States. I mean, we do know it's had some cases, I believe in California and maybe Colorado. Um, my question is specifically when, you, you know, like if I were to get tested for COVID, do they then go on to later test my test for, is the variant in it or how does, can you explain that a little bit? And so why we know this is serious or how we would better understand that? Greg, oh, Greg, you have to unmute him. Greg could on. you unmute Dr. Okay. Kettner, please? Thank We're gonna you. We're going to play that game where we both push the button. Yeah. There we go. Back and forth. Welcome to Zoom. Um, yeah, that this is an area of a lot of, uh, of attention for us right now. Um, you know, the, this new variant, part of the reason I think it was discovered in the UK is because the UK does a lot of genomic surveillance on their test samples, which other areas don't necessarily do. We're doing more of that now, but it depends on which test you're doing. Um, there's several dis different tests that are available. In our case, you know, if you're if you're doing a rapid test like ours, it's just positive for COVID. We don't know which right. strain of COVID it is, but if that goes to our reference lab in Omaha and the tests that are done at UNMC and other places, they are doing genomic surveillance now on those tests to look and see which you know, are there variations in this? And you can search those out. The The one that they're looking at is this B614G mutation, which has been seen other places. And I, I suspect we're going to find that it's, that it is other places. It's it's kind of like finding your, your keys under the light. You're like, well, it's the only place I could see. The only place we were really looking was in Great Britain. But, you know, time will tell. I guess to answer your question, um, it depends which test you get. Um, the more rapid tests are not going to differentiate between those strains. Reference tests and ones done in reference labs are going to take a certain number of those and look at them uh, to see which variant they are. That's helpful. I mean, that was just one of the questions I had been asked, you know, if, if we're worried about this variant, you know, how is that being determined if it's become more prevalent in the United States or more local? So you're, you're saying that it's it's being monitored now more knowing that it's out there, they're looking for it in this genetic variant um, with routine monitoring. Yeah, because there's different tests. Say if you go to the nursing home, tomorrow I make nursing home rounds, I have to get tested before I can go into the nursing home. And that's just a rapid antigen test. So right. there's no way for them to differentiate. But, you know, it's a, it's a cheap, easy, fairly reliable test if it's applied multiple times. And then we have reference test where we're saying, gosh, you know, we've done a prior test and it was negative, but we're suspicious. So we're going to do a reference test that goes, you know, to a, a reference lab like UNMC, and they're going to take those and then look at those to see if there's variations there. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Sure. Greg, I have a question for Kelly and you and, and or maybe Josh, uh, <coughs> regarding the, um, President-elect Biden has said that in his first 100 days, he wants to have a, a nationwide mask mandate. How would like, is what we're doing here like kind of a moot point? If, if they would institute something like that, how does that trickle down to the local level? You know, does it stop anywhere like at state or, or with certain divisions of government or do you guys know much about that? Kelly? I've not looked into that yet. Uh, I'm assuming if there's a nationwide mask mandate, we're going to be subject to it. Okay. And also, I mean, just to be clear, the, the, the devil's always in the details. I mean, there's right. no reason to believe that it would be exactly like what we are proposing here tonight. tonight. And so it would just be a question of, you know, to what extent does it apply? And, you know, is would ours you know, be more restrictive or less restrictive. And that's something that, 
you know, Kelly would have to advise on if it came to that. Thank you. The other one that's out there that relates to when there's some of these federal ones is enforcement. And if there was a federal one, the question would be is how they implemented an enforcement mechanism. Otherwise, the feds themselves have to go out and enforce it. You have to be sued by the federal government or FBI agents or whatever it is. But usually what they have, for instance, with like seatbelt laws and things like that, is they tie fiscal ends to it. And they say, well, you're not going to receive these highway funds unless you make it so you require uh, seatbelt laws or you raise your alcohol limit to 21 years old. Otherwise, you don't qualify fiscally and we'll hold these dollars back. It really depends on how they build it and what is attached to it to make the mechanism. Um, then you also may see states do other things as well. But a, a lot of you know, us just throwing things at the wall trying to answer that question at this point without seeing what they would do, so. Thank you. Anyone else from the council have any questions or comments? I, I have a couple questions. Um, I think Dana brought it up and I, I've had the question myself. If we have a positivity rate of around 30 to 35 percent, what's the other 65 percent? Is that a question for like Dr. Kettner? Uh, or Roger, Roger, Dr. Kettner, Laura, somebody that can answer that, I guess. I, yeah, I think you have to look at where the testing is. There's some testing that we do that is patients that have symptoms. And for those, you know, there's some nonspecific viral stuff. We do end up doing, especially in the emergency department, we do serial testing. You know, we say, well, we'll do COVID, we'll do flu. We have a panel where we can test for anywhere from four to 16 different respiratory pathogens. So that's kind of one pathway. And then there's, you know, we've got the whole test Nebraska site here where anybody can just sign up you know some people are signing up and getting tested because their employer says they can't go back to work until they have a negative test or they want to travel for Christmas and so you know there's a lot of negative tests coming through that are there that are just what I would call peace of mind tests you know where folks just want to get tested and they're they're not sick so it's not as if every test that's done is somebody that's that's really ill so yeah, you got to interpret in those contexts. And, and I don't have the data to say what the test Nebraska positivity is versus what we're doing in our drive up testing versus what we're seeing in the ER. I can tell you what I, what I feel like it is, but I wouldn't want to say that without actually looking at the numbers. Okay, and that's fine. That's I, it was just one of those questions that, you know, if we're looking at positivity rates, you know, there are two sides to that didn't, you never see what's on the other side of the coin on that positivity rate. So I was just curious on that. Um, and then my second question um, is based on Roger's uh, letter, um, particularly to subsection D where we're talking about Seward County transmission and the cases per million. Um, with this mask mandate, is this something, I know you stated in here that Seward County still continues to see a lot of COVID transmission. Uh, currently, as you had of the week of the December 25th, we had 553 cases per million um, is way too high. The goal should be under 100 cases per million. And to get to this number, we should need to be averaging just less than two positives per day. Um, do you know when the last time we have hit an average of two positives per day? There we go. I, I think know, you're good, Roger. Yeah, I'm good. Hey, Carl, that's a really good question. I don't have that right in front of me, but I'd be happy to go back through all my time of calculating that. Uh, I would hate to pick a date and, and be way off, but there had to been a time, because I, I remember the time when we hit 100 cases in Seward and everybody got really excited because Butler County hadn't gotten there yet, York hadn't gotten there, what in the heck is going on in Seward County? So I think um, I could go back and find that if that is something that you need, or, or maybe Laura can speak to it. But I would guess, if I was just gonna guess, I would guess it's gonna be sometime back in, um, back in the midsummer, because there was a time in July when we were thinking about shutting off our, um, 
shutting off our visitor policy and all that because the numbers have gotten to a point where the risk dial was in great shape and, and everybody thought we were out of the woods. And, um, and then it all changed again. So I would say we were probably in that range of acceptable um, cases per million or cases per 100,000 sometime in maybe July. And I see Laura nodding. Uh, I remember having that discussion in one of our community uh, communications uh, that we do every other Thursday. And we were talking about that number of 100 and trying to be below 100. And then we were talking about states that were hitting that number and that's where we wanted to get to. So that's why I kind of used the, the number 100 coming from uh, Laura and her team's um, evaluation of that. But I would say it was probably about July when we had seen, seen that kind of number. And I'll, I'll defer to Laura if I'm off on that or if that's about where we were at. Yeah, and Roger, while we, you were talking, I went and looked it up. Um, yeah, it was right at the end of the summer before we got our kind of back to school peak. And, and we kind of meandered right around that. And we were well below it for a good part of the spring and summer. But we haven't visited that since late in the summer. Yeah, no, and that's I was just curious because then looking at the, the the data that I get from Four Corners, yeah, it looked like it was right around eclipse that two mark around the seventh of July. So it, it's right around that time. So I I think I think for me that's kind of a key thing though, knowing the the uh, activity of a virus spreading, um, being more active in the uh, winter months heading into early spring and being the least active in the summer. Um, so for me, it, it's um, interesting that our goal is to have year round at the lowest activity of a viral infection. Um, but that's just me um, on that one. Um, I, again, like I said, I, I, we can debate the statistics go around and around with that um, time and time again. Um, you know, and that that's not what I'm really here for it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, is I think there is a need there's really, um, you know, some importance into people being able to control this on their own. Um, and, and following, you know, some guidelines uh, definitely helps in that direction. Uh, my issue again is taking it to the council and, and having them force it on businesses rather than going to each business and having them choose to follow it or not to follow it. Um, so with that, again, we had the letter of support for the mask mandate uh, earlier from a business in town that they were elated to see that their business went from clients coming in at a 50% mask rate to 100. Um, that's when it really hit me that uh, businesses can do this on their own if they do feel this is a need. And we did have a lot of businesses contacting us to support this mandate um, to alleviate the stress of them choosing it on their own. Um, but at the same time, I believe that is their own uh, initiative to take and not ours to force upon people. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to be voting no again on this. Um, but I do want to advise people, like I said, there is cases this is going around um, for those that are willing uh, to risk it. You know, that's up to their choice. For those that are worried about catching it, um, I would recommend N95 mask for recepting the virus as being your best option if you're going to get a mask and wearing it around public. Um, but other than that, that's all I've got. Okay, thanks, Carl. Is there any other council members? Have any other questions or comments? This is Singleton. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, John. This one's for Laura. Uh, and maybe Roger can help on this too. Um, and one thing that, you know, that it's real important uh, for Seward and the surrounding communities is the first responders that have to go pick up the sick people uh, that have the COVID and one thing that has happened is uh, the EMTs are, have got vaccinated under the 1A, uh, but the firefighters that are also responders on the rescue squads are going to have to wait till after 1B or later to get the vaccination. 
And one thing that concerns me is even I know on our department, I think we've had three members that have contracted the COVID-19 and you know, with them being the front workers along that, that I would think our community would push to have, you know, if Laura could support us or Roger support us to try to push to get all the responders uh, vaccinated sooner than later. So we're not contracting, even though we put gowns on, we put the mask on, we still contract it. And we've had members that have gotten exposed. So I'm just being concerned there that the other responders that assist the EMTs on the squads have to wait and we're exposing them. I just didn't know if Laura if, or Roger, if you could do some supporting there to support them first uh, responders that are essential. Um, thanks for that comment, John. Um, so, this has really been somewhat complicated in the last week. Um, we learned last week that the um, that they had changed the priority list at the state, and one of the things that has happened is is as we have, and and this is Memorial Healthcare Systems as well as we've agreed, uh, signed we had to sign agreements that we would follow certain. The, the states led priority groups in how the vaccine is given out. And right now, I, you know, the, the problem that we have, we would, we would like to be able to give it as, to as many people that want it as fast as possible. Um, but we're just, it's been just dribbling in the vaccine. So we are, um, really just because we have agreed to follow the state's priority groups, that is how it's been laid out. And we've been trying to be faithful to what uh, leadership at the state level has um, laid out for us. We would, and, and we have a really good plan, I think, to get through these um, groups and get everyone vaccinated if we can just get some vaccine. I, or I, I guess that's a question I, I'll just chime in to tag on to John's question. Um, I know you mentioned a number, I think you or Roger, maybe 1,300 vaccines that we've had. Um, what's, I guess, I know that there's been a slow rollout nationally, but is it a specific holdup because we don't have the capacity for the, the super cold storage that the Pfizer vaccine requires? Is it that there just truly isn't enough produced um, is it because we're a rural area? I mean, what, what is there one specific thing that's a, a slowness for us specifically? The state of Nebraska has been allocated a X amount of vaccines and that's what the governor often reports on. And, and I can't off the top of my head remember what that number is. What they have done is taken much of the Pfizer, well, and we've, we're receiving as a state Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Mm -hmm. The Pfizer vaccines have been um, moved in large part over to the pharmacy program and also allocated to Lincoln and Omaha because it's just a logistical issue that they're sending more of the Pfizer that direction. They're sending Moderna to us because it's easier to move around. It, it requires refrigeration rather than um, that super cool temperatures. We do have some freezers, some ultra cool temperature freezers in our district, but um, they are choosing to send us the Moderna instead, which we're still getting our allotment. And um, so some of that vaccine, we have additional doses coming to our long-term care through the pharmacy program, but we, uh, Roger and I, as well as the rest of the hospitals in my district. So this is, a, this 1300 doses is being spread out across four counties. So in reality, Laura less mm -hmm. right I, I want to intervene here just a minute but i i just want to throw a number at you that we just did our tally for the end of the year and we had 585 calls in seward for the year over 400 and fi over 450 of them were the nursing home and one of the things that 
you know, they're putting the, I know the elderly and they're very important. I have parents that are elderly too, but I still think that your responders are just as important as the elderly because we have to assist in their aid to pick them up, to bring them to the medical centers when they have COVID. And that's just my biggest concern that I, I would think that the four corners would really push, uh, you know, to assist the responders that are also getting sick because we're picking up the people that need to get the medical service. And, and I, I have definitely, we have definitely as um, health departments been trying to um, work through this. We understand and there are first responders all over the state that it feel the same way you do. And at this point, um, you know, we're really trying to talk to leadership about it. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're really, we really just don't even have vaccine at this point um, to get out of 1A. So, um, you know, we can definitely carry that, that conversation back up to leadership again and do what we can. And I know I've had at least three groups from Seward County call me just in the last two days about this. And um, we would really like to be able to do first responders and the 75 year olds next, if possible. Laura, if you could, that, I think our, our, I can't speak for the whole council, but I think, you know, that's something that's important to all of us. I think, um, you know, John, I think it's a great question and it's one that we're trying to field every day here uh, for the first responders. Um, you know, but we are really tied to this, these tiers and the first tier in phase 1B is 75 and older. And we've got to be real careful if we don't follow the tiers, um, we'll get allocations that will be smaller than we want or need because we haven't cooperated. And so what you can count on, though, is we are committed to when we get the allotment and it's time, we will get that out as fast as we possibly can. We, we vaccinated all the staff in our organization who wanted it, 185 people in two and a half days. We vaccinated all the EMSs that qualified in one night. We have 100 people signed up for tomorrow night to vaccinate. And when we're done with that, we have done every vaccine dose we have. We don't have any left after this week. Region five will get done later in the week. And the 350 we got allocated, we got out as fast as we can get out. And that's a lot of work and we will let the fire folks know, uh, we know who they are and keep them posted. When we get it, we will try to get something planned either the same night we get it. Um, the first doses we got were on the morning of the 22nd and we delivered 61 of them in the arms that afternoon. That's our strategy. That's what we're gonna do when the time comes. So I hope that helps people that we are committed to getting it in their arms as fast as we get it. We just don't have it. And um, we, we want it, we want these tiers to go fast. We want these vaccines to show up at our facility. We want to store a thousand of these. We don't want to store 350. Uh, we also have the ability to store the, the ultra cold stuff. If we have to go that route, we'll do that as well. So we're geared up. It's just that we're waiting on getting the vaccine on the doorstep and we'll act as fast as we can, so. And the uh, tiers could change again or are they 100% locked in? I mean, Theoretically, the state could change the levels within the tiers or change people from one tier to another at any point, correct? Yeah, in fact, last week they changed all of the, they changed groups within the tiers last week and they said it was leadership. So we're assuming it was from the very top. And um, I think, you know, the more, all I can say is, you know, I think we all have to advocate as much as possible for what our communities wants want and that's what we're trying to do. Thanks for that information. Any other questions or comments from the council? You know, there's obviously a lot of passion on both sides of this uh, mask mandate. And, uh, you know, I appreciate all the feedback we received uh, supporting it and against it. Uh, I guess where, where I sit on this and uh, because I've had uh, emails asking me what my thought process is, I'll uh, share my thought process and most of it has been discussed tonight. We have schools back in session. We have winter sports gearing up again. 
Uh, we're reintroducing the Concordia students that went home and are coming back to our community. And we now have a vaccine that uh, hopefully uh, we continue to receive the doses and we can get those people at high risk, our first responders and, and the like uh, uh, vaccinated. Uh, and, and with that, uh, for those reasons, I, I support uh, extending this through the end of February to, to March 3rd. Uh, I, I hope things uh, look the same or better come then. Uh, because I, I, I just think for, for me, I believe the masks do make a difference. And, and I, I listen to uh, who I trust and consider as experts. Uh, and I guess with that, I'll introduce the ordinance. Okay. I'll go ahead and read the title. An ordinance to amend Article 2, Section 52.1.11, entitled Reduction in the Spread of the Novel Coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, Chapter 51 of the Seward Municipal Code, to establish a sunset provision to provide for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form and to provide for a time when this ordinance shall take effect. The ordinance has, but has been read by title and is designated as ordinance number 2021-2 and the title is hereby approved. I need a motion to dispense with the statutory rule. So moved. We have a second. Second. Moved by Coulterman, second by Beck. And Mayor, since we are two and a half hours into the meeting, as we prepare for this one, you might want to do a little bit of road mapping again, just so people understand what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, one moment. I can reread my, uh, as far as like what I read before. Um, uh, and, and I can jump in real quick if you'd like me to. Essentially, this is a, this is a standard procedural vote on all ordinances that we normally undertake to suspend the statutory rules of three readings. Um, you'll hear us vote on this every single time. We did it on the ordinance right before this. Uh, it requires a three-fourths vote, which is six members of the council. Uh, should the vote fail and we not reach six votes, that doesn't mean that the ordinance fails. It means that it will be heard again at a later date for another meeting or two, and then at that time voted on and so that happened last time we considered this about a month ago. I think a lot of people jumped off the call or didn't understand what we were doing. So what will happen now is they're going to vote to suspend the rules and just vote up or down potentially on uh, this ordinance tonight to extend it or let it sunset. If this vote right now fails, it moves on to another meeting for consideration at a later date. Okay. So we had a motion and a second. So is there any further discussion on the motion to dispense with the statutory rule? Seeing none, please call the roll. Neither, Greg, yes. <laughs> Will, that was Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camprith. Yes. Miller. Yep. And I have to go to another page to get Alyssa. Councilmember yes. Hendricks. Yes. Uh, motion approved. All right. This is ordinance number 2021 2. Would anyone like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted as read? Move for approval. We have a mo motion by Beck, second by Coulterman. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on the ordinance itself? Now this just goes ahead and says that we're moving forward to vote. No, that that would the, the previous vote was on waiving the three readings. This is a vote on the actual ordinance itself. To have it extended. Okay. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions or comments from the council? If not, then the question is, shall ordinance number 2021-2 be finally passed and adopted? Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. 
Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Campreth. No. Miller. No. Hendricks. No. Motion passes five to three. That's our last ordinance for the evening. So I'll need one final motion to make the ordinances a part of the permanent record. So moved. So moved. Second. moved by Schmidt, second by Miller. The motion in a second, please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yeah. Camprick. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. Motion passes. All right, next we have the city of Greg, next we have the city administrator's report. Uh, it, it's late. I can uh, answer any questions you have. Um, we kind of discussed it all tonight. We're working through a number of projects and grants with uh, PetSource and trying to finish those up for the year. So we're excited to get that kind of wound down. Um, but if you got any questions about my report in there, I know it was kind of short because I was finally took a vacation week. So, uh, but thanks to all my staff and all my department heads. I know we had a big snowstorm and everything else. And I was in town, didn't go anywhere, but uh, I want to thank all of them and, and uh, all the work that they did and kind of picking up a lot of the stuff so that I could be out of the building for a little while. So I appreciate all their work. Hey, Greg, I had a question for you. Um, I had a, an, an individual here in town ask me if we could maybe, when we do the street clearing, send that out to that, um, that text system because they weren't notified that I don't know if it got sent out. I didn't see anything, but we we posted on social media. We seem to be getting our best um, response rate on snow removal by putting that out and then trying to generate organic shares and things like that versus uh, issuing like a snow emergency, which we do with the balance on one side versus the other. That actually causes more headache is what uh, street superintendent Bob Myers has reported. And so uh, for the most part, people have done a really good job uh, when we put it on social media the night before and we give them kind of a timeline of when trucks roll. So if we say they're going to roll at 2 a.m., a lot of people see that. Now, again, I know a lot of maybe people don't use social media. Um, and so we will encourage uh, the paper and other places to pick that up. But I've always tried to reserve the code red system for like real legit emergencies that no one should turn away from like the water restrictions when we we're not supposed to consume the water, uh, when we thought the flood was elevating to a danger level and we were looking at potential evacuation. I really have always as a policy tried to reserve that system for really dire emergencies. Um, and so we can continue to work at, at, and I would surely advise anybody, if you're a person out there who's interested in snow removal and stuff, we do try when we know it's coming to put notices out on social media of what our plans are and what we'd like to see from the public. So like our, follow our Facebook, make sure you follow us on there. Uh, we also have a Twitter uh, and we're working on Instagram and things like that, trying to be more communicative, but uh, we can't catch everybody at every direction. We, you know, the independent's been really good about picking our stuff up and sharing it as well. And we just encourage, if you know the Facebook algorithms and social media algorithms, if you see that up there, share it. Maybe your friends will see it. Maybe your neighbors will see it and that will help get it uh, out to them. So if it's it's things like that, share it. You know, if it's a, a picture of my dog or something, you don't have to share that, so. But if you guys have okay, other ideas you. or other things, shoot me an email or constituents or anybody else has an idea to how to get that information out. Uh, I know it's uh, frustrating. And this snow particularly was frustrating because we had done a lot of work and cleared a lot of areas. And by the time we came back because of the length of that snowstorm event, it was already full again and we had to go by again. And then it was at such depth that we even went by a third time in some areas because uh, it was just a mess. So, but we, okay. we tried to communicate it. Yep, I thought they did a good job, Greg. And I assume that was the city out today, uh, cleaning up also somebody at least on our street was in a bobcat picking up ice and getting it off the road. Yeah, we're trying to, you know, with the thaw coming in at some point, we're trying to get it out of the gutters and things like that so that 
uh, it can flow in the stormwater system. Um, my kids were super appreciative that Bob and the crew waited till after uh, the New Year's break to take it out of the cul-de-sac. So they had a giant fort going for a few extra days. So I, I let them know that they appreciated that. We didn't ask for it. We did not, they just, it worked out well. Anything else on my report or things I like to cover? Okay. If not, I'd entertain a motion to accept the city administrator's report. So moved. So moved. Second. We had a motion by, I think Singleton is second by Camprith. Um, there you go. Please call, call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camprith. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. All right, do we have any future requests for council agenda items or administrative action? Seeing none, then uh, Jonathan Jank, could you uh, update us on upcoming events? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one very quick thing. Um, at the end of January each year, we typically have our annual awards banquet. Um, we are uh, moving that until April. We'll have more details of a save the date. We've always appreciated the city of Seward's participation and support as we get to celebrate businesses in the community and across the county. Um, so there will be um, kind of public announcement coming out here, but we have officially, or we will officially be moving it from the end of January to April of this year. That's all. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and so with that, um, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Move. Moved second. by Schmidt, second by Coulterman. Please call the roll. Wilkin. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Beck. Yes. Coulterman. Yes. Singleton. Yes. Camperin. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all for participating this evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.